morning. So um, quite a few people want to hear a little bit about the advocacy, what we do for the homeless, and then some people want to hear the story, but I only have 20 minutes. So I think what I'll do is start with the story, and then in the question component of this piece, you guys can shoot the questions to me, and I'll answer them as best as I can. Is that cool? All right. So I am a native of Indianapolis, born and raised here in Indianapolis. Um, I went to Northwest High School, and I went to Crispus Attucks. I was in the medical magnet program when I was younger. Uh, I wanted to be a doctor when I was older. I wanted to be a surgeon. Um, and then towards the end of the school year, we take a bus and go down to Bloomington to see what that looks like, right? So we see the cadavers, we see the medical students, and we see all that wonderful stuff. Um, and then when we get back on the bus, it dawns on me that I don't like bodily fluids <laughs> at all. So this became kind of a, a situation for me. Um, but fortunately, uh, during high school, kind of starting in the eighth grade, my cousins and brothers and I, we were in like a boy band. That sounds funny to say now. Uh, but we did that, and we did that all through high school. So I fell back on that uh, instead of pursuing uh, the medical career. Um, and I came off the stage. I didn't want to stay on the stage. I went behind the scenes, and I started managing different bands, groups, singers, models, uh, comedians, and things of that nature. So I spent a little over 20 years doing that, and I started my own business, and it was called Five Star Entertainment. So my background is in sports and entertainment, because I acquired some um, uh, high school graduates, or high school football players and basketball players who were looking to go forward, uh, and their parents had sought some kind of consultant with myself, uh, so I helped with that project as well. Um, so that's kind of my, my background, and a lot of people ask me, so did you just leave everything to go help the homeless? And it kind of didn't happen that way. It started with a divorce, right? The divorce was the key to everything. Um, when I remember being in the eighth grade, seventh and eighth grade, and I told myself I would never get a divorce, ever, right? I seen the impact that it had on families, and I seen the impact that it had on kids, and those kids happened to be my friends. So I never wanted to be a part of that at all. So we fast forward 35 years later, and I'm going through my third divorce. And I'm like, what in the world is going on with this? So I'm really, I'm really challenged with this. I'm really disturbed you know, with this divorce situation. So I had to get real with myself and my situation if I wanted to escape these divorces. So I remember asking myself the first question, who is the common denominator in all these marriages? That would be me, right? So I might be the problem. But why didn't I think I was the problem? Because my friends and family was telling me otherwise. So they were kind of enabling me, right? So I'm really truly challenged with that because I don't want to do divorce number four. I, I'm really, I'm over that. So I said to myself, where can I go that I can get away from my families and, and friends and they cannot find me or, or locate me and I can just get my head clear and think about, you know, my next steps coming out and back into the to life, if you will. Um, so it came to me. I said, I'll go to the mission. I will go into the mission and nobody in my network would ever think about looking for me in that mission. So I go to the mission and all is well. So the first couple of weeks, Everything is how I planned it, no accountability, no responsibility. I'm thinking things through, I'm journaling, I'm really getting a grasp on, you know, what my outlook was looking like at that particular time. So shortly thereafter, when I stopped thinking about me, you know, my awareness opened back up and I could see things around me again. And all of a sudden I recognized that the people at the mission were not treating the homeless people the way that I thought that they would treat homeless people. Right, because I always seen the mission as an extension of the church, and the church people would not treat poor people this way. So, not to be a problem, which I can be at times, I said to myself, How can I help? How can I be a part of the solution and not a part of the problem? I'm here, right, and I have a skill set that can pos possibly help people. So, I indeed just jumped right in in the mission and I just started helping people because the problems were very small. You know, people just need simple information. Uh, questions answered and different things like that. So I felt like, you know, this was, this is really cool. And I kind of started some momentum with that. But there were three people in particular who I really feel brought my life to where it is today during that process. So the first gentleman 
Uh, he was early 60s, um, and he always walked around a mission with these papers in his hands. And so I said, he, he'll be the, my first project, right? So I buddied up to him, and what we found out was that the papers were applications, but he couldn't read. But he had memorized the boxes, so if I told him what the box said, he could put in there what needed to go in there, right? So I, I said, hey, we, we're here at the mission. Why don't we sometimes go over to the library, and I can kind of tutor you with this reading thing, right? And he looks at me, and then he walks off. And I'm like, whoa, I hope I didn't offend this guy. But I seen him up at the counter um, at the mission, and he was getting his uh, tote. We have to put our things in the tote. And I couldn't quite make out what he was doing, and I didn't want to stare. So I you know, just kind of stood there looking for my next project. And then the next thing you know, he comes walking back, and he has three books. He has To Catch a Mockingbird. No, no, To Kill a Mockingbird. <laughs> Sorry. Catcher in the Rye and Shakespeare and a work of Shakespeare. And he said, I want to read these. And I'm like, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, we're on a Dr. Seuss level, but <laughs> we can get there. Right, we can definitely get there. So um, we proceeded forward, and that individual, I always mention him first because I really, for the first time in my life, experienced somebody that had faith, right? This guy, he knew before he died that he was gonna read those books because when you're homeless, you don't carry around books. That space is, pre is a premium, you know? But he really moved me to where it made our interaction very meaningful, right? Because whatever he was believing, I definitely wanted to play into that. So we, we, we did that little thing, and that was, our, that was my first example. And then the second person who I helped who was very meaningful, his name was John, and he was autistic, right? And John had fallen through the cracks because his parents had died. So when I first assessed his situation, I knew that he was getting a check when he was younger, now he's over 18, and I know the government didn't think he was cured of his autism, so why did your check get cut off, right? So I figured out that he had to file some additional paperwork now that he was over 18. So we go up to the pyramids, up at the pyramids they have a Work One Express Center, uh, they have a fax machine, they have Wi-Fi, they have everything you need to get back into the job market ASAP. And we kind of borrowed that because John was high functioning in his autism. So he could tell me what schools he had went to and places he had lived and so forth. Some doctors he could remember. So our goal was to get that paperwork and present a case for Social Security to get his Social Security turned back on. Um, and fortunately, that happened for John. And once he got his income, he was able to get affordable housing. And now he's off the streets. So John was probably the second person who really, really had an impact on, on, on my helping people, if you will. And it was funny because becoming friends with John was very easy because I noticed that at lunchtime and dinner time there was some bullying going on with the food, you know, with his food. So when you're 6'4", 300 pounds, you don't have much of a bully problem. So we became friends real quick and we worked through that process with John. And then last but not least, the third gentleman, um, he was a young man and he was 18 years old. And I was just amazed that somebody so young could be in homelessness, you know, that soon in life. But what I found out about him was his mom had passed away. They lived in Luger Tower downtown. His mom had passed away, and he did not know how to transfer the Section 8 voucher into his name. So when the eviction notices showed up, he just, he just left. He fled, he fled the situation. So he came to the mission. Uh, but what I found out was his grandmother, who lived in Atlanta, she was on a fixed income, and she was setting money aside for him uh, to get him a bus ticket to come to Atlanta. So I asked, I said, how, how much is the bus ticket? And he said, $37. I'm like, wow, well, we would spend that at lunchtime, you know, downtown. So anyway, I said, hey, I want to buy the bus ticket and send you home. And he was a little challenged because we were both standing in the mission, so he didn't know how that would play out, right? So I said, call your grandmother and have her make arrangements for you to be picked up first thing in the morning. And he did that, and I spoke with her, his grandmother, and she was a lovely lady, and she was very, very excited that he was coming home, and I was happy that I could be a part of that. So we left the mission, we went to Marsh when it was here, got him some food so he could eat on his way home, and we went over to the Greyhound. I, we, set, we bought the ticket, we sat, and we waited for the bus. And then the bus came, and we headed out to the bus, and uh, that was it. Something changed with that transaction because as he was getting on that bus, 
he turned around and he hugged me, right? And he's crying, but I know something was wrong because I'm crying too. And I don't know why I'm crying, right? I'm like, what, what? So we get him on the bus, we get him out of there, and I head back to the mission. Um, and it's very interesting because I really felt like I was emotionally unstable on that walk from Greyhound to Wheeler Mission. And I got back to the mission, and when you're at the mission on Delaware Street, you can either go into the day room where there's TV, uh, games, newspapers, you know, people fellowship and so forth, or you can go over to uh, the chapel where there's just tables and chairs. And I enjoyed journaling and kind of unwinding for the day, so I would always go into the chapel and then kind of strategize for to who, what I would do the next day or who I would help, what that would look like. And I sat in the same place every day. So when I walked in to the chapel, where I sat, there was a long line of people standing there waiting for help. And it was right at that moment that I knew I wanted to do this, right? I know people say convicted, use the word convicted a lot, but at that moment, I was definitely convicted because I enjoyed what I was doing. I felt something in helping the people, right? And then not taking anything in return really, I don't know, it just really moved me in a very special way, if you will. So that night, I'm in my bunk, and I asked myself, now, what does that look like, right? Because I can go home, lock the house, put the cars in the garage, take some time off work, but that would just be a camping trip, and that's not what was needed. I needed to see the world through the eyes of the homeless people. That lens, I needed to see how things were working or was not working through that particular lens. I had to become indigenous to that population. So it became clear to me that night that I had to let everything go if I was going to be homeless. Right. So a lot of people ask me, um, so how difficult or how challenging was it to give everything up? Right. And then I remind them, remember how this story began. It began with a divorce. Right. So even the divorce played into this whole situation for me because I could give everything to my ex-wife and then move forward with my newfound mission in mind. And I'm, I'm happy to say that was almost 10 years ago. So things have definitely worked out and been beneficial to the community as a whole, uh, to the people who come alongside and help. And we have raised awareness with the powers that be. And that, that makes a world of difference to me. So today, um, one of the things that we do, uh, primarily, we had to scale back. Because when you talk about homelessness, that's a huge situation. But I'm not giving uh, the decision makers and the policy makers a way out because people will say, they'll say to me all the time, homelessness is just so complex, it's so challenging. Okay, geometry is too, <laughs> but when you learn it, right, then you can handle it. So you have to get to know it, you have to learn it, right? So one of the things that we now do is we do the basic, we do basic needs. So we come here with Mike uh, on Wednesdays uh, from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. And we set up on the west side of the atrium, and we, first, of, first and foremost, we sign folks up for health care insurance. We have the best health care program in the nation, right? In Indiana, we get medical, dental, and vision for $1 a month. Other states all have medical um, Medicaid, but we have all three. Um, but what we didn't want to happen was they, they, you know, brag about us having that, but we didn't have access to it because that dollar is still a lot of money for somebody who doesn't have money. So after we enroll folks and they get approved, then we pay. We take that totally off the table. The second thing that we do, um, we have a website called indymills.org, and we pass that out, and all the food in the downtown area and the surrounding downtown area, we list it on this website, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So you'll have your food, you have insurance, and then we provide a, a, a mailing address so people can navigate their homelessness. So we have a P.O. box, everybody uses it, and then every Wednesday you can come here and pick up your mail. So, uh, and then last but not least, the newest thing that we have, we teamed up with the Lifeline Assistance Program. We have a representative here from 10 to, tw 10 to 12 um, every Wednesday, and he signs people up and gives them uh, phones, telephones. And this was very important because what we found when people would sign up for the Lifeline phones, majority of people were at the shelters. So the, the program would say, hey, we already sent the phone to that address. So you can't send one phone to the whole shelter, right, to try to accommodate folks. But he has phones with him, 
And when you sign up for it, he'll give it to you in real time. So you bring whatever services you are, are on, food stamps or what have you, he'll take a picture of that, send it back. They send him a confirmation. He programs the phone, and he gives you the phone. So it's a wonderful, wonderful situation. And then we do case and crisis management, but we partner with a lot of people in the city to make different things happen, right? So if somebody is stranded in Indianapolis, um, we have a partners who do. Now, when you're stranded, I have, to, I have to validate that, right? So if you say, hey, I'm stranded, and you're from Arkansas, then chances are the area code on your phone should be the Arkansas area code, and your ID should be Arkansas, right? If those two things line up, we can get you back home, right? Um, because before, people were running here talking about they were stranded, and then I realized that I was financing Match.com trips, <laughs> right? I'm like, oh, we, we can't do that at all. You know, so, um, so with those, those two checks in place, we can get you home if you, if you are stranded. So we do a, a, a lot of things like that. And yesterday, we had our first uh, Burmese client. A fella came from New York to here, lost his luggage with American Airlines, and because they couldn't understand him, they just took him to the mission. So we are now working with him trying to find his luggage with American Airlines. We found a Burmese community uh, the resource center, and we've connected him with that, and we got him up and going with his situation. So that's some of the things that we do. Um, one other thing that I want to point out, um, I don't know if you guys are aware, but there's a, what's called a point-in-time count for the homeless that occurs either the second or third week in January where different agencies go out and count people, uh, homeless people, unsheltered people. And over the last 10 years or so, that number has gravitated between 1,600 to 1,800. And I believe personally, because that number was so low, I don't think that the policymakers were really interested in, in like giving that their full attention because they're service providers and faith-based people who could deal with that. Um, so that has always hindered us. But over at CHIP, before Alan Witchie left, um, they partnered up with the Polish Center over at IUPUI. And at the different places where homeless people go to initiate services, Wheeler, Horizon, HIP, and places like that, they set in an intern at all of those places and counted the people who was coming in experiencing homelessness. So in 2018, they released the number. It was 14,696 people experiencing homelessness in Marion County alone almost 15,000 people. We only have 3,164 shelter beds in our, program, in our system. That's all we have. So the deficit there is going to create an issue, right? Because people have to be somewhere, right? So whether it's in a park, in a tent camp, in a parking garage, or in an alleyway, they have to be somewhere. And I feel like we need to address that in some kind of way. And there's not a one size fit all answer to that. But it's great if we come together and have a conversation about what that looks like. And one of the things that I think our city is now aware of is it's probably not in the best interest. And I don't say this in a malice way. I don't think it's in the best interest to bring off service providers to the table because my existence funds, funds that, that's their job, right? So we need to diversify who's at the table Right? And then bring them alongside, but we need to diversify and look at the problems of homelessness, not necessarily the symptoms of homelessness. So that's kind of what I have for you guys today. Um, so I think I will open it up for Q&A at this point. Thank you.